On that point alone, every one of you should be outraged and calling your members and telling them to fix the Constitution. Can we not police our own in this state? Do I have to go to a corrupt Supreme Court and beg them, please hear me? Can we not police our own in this state? Can we not take the time to call our representative, call our senator, and to instruct them, assert your right to instruct them and tell them to fix the Tennessee Constitution? And for Speaker Sexton, the next thing that's supposed to happen with that announcement is I'm supposed to get up there and explain to them everything I just explained to you about the right of petition. So Tennessee Firearms Association, uh, thank you for, for having me here tonight and for the, for the viewers online. Uh, I, have, I have no doubt in my mind what I'm going to teach here tonight is the answer literally to all dissatisfaction with our government. I know beyond doubt that our government is broken and that corruption runs, runs rampant throughout our legislative and judicial branches of government. And what I'm going to teach you here tonight is the literal answer on, on how, to, how to fix these problems. What I also know, and what all of you know, is if, if we continue to do the same thing, we're going to get the same result. And so if we remain apathetic, and we remain silent, and we do not start standing up for ourselves and defending our power that is inherent in us, if we, if we continue to remain silent, we're going to get the same result. And that's continued and worsening corruption in our legislative and judicial branches. So what I'm encouraging people to do is, is reassert your power and, and just start uh, by, by making noise and calling our legislators and demanding that, that this work that I'm going to talk about tonight be restored. What, what we're talking about here it's, it's the history. And so tonight, what we're going to do is, is imagine yourself not listening to me. You're listening to history tonight is literally what we're talking about. So if we go to the Tennessee Constitution, Article 1, Section 23, it says that citizens have a right in a peaceable manner to assemble together for their common good, to instruct their representatives, and to apply to those invested with the powers of government the redress of grievance, or other proper purposes by address or remonstrance. The punctuation of, of, of this uh, um, clearly establishes several rights in here. We have a right to assemble. That's not just assemble ourselves. That's to assemble our legislative houses. Historically, that's what the right of assembly means is we're going to assemble and instruct you we're going to assert the power that is inherent in us. And in Tennessee, we can, we can do it for redress of grievance, but we can also do it for proper purpose. Proper purpose can be election integrity. Proper purpose can be term limits. Proper purpose can be decided whatever we decide it is. And our founders put in here that we can do it by address or remonstrance. An address is an oral presentation sit down, I have something to say, and you have a duty and an obligation to listen to me because we have a right to instruct. So I told you, we're going we're gonna to be taking a look, a walk through history here. These are, these are two law, re law review articles. I've handed everybody out a, a copy of these. This one here, Shall Make No Law Abridging, is from the Cincinnati Law Review, and this, this article was cited to me uh, by Judge Bennett from the Tennessee Court of Appeals in my Bandamus case. Uh, so since the Tennessee Court of Appeals cited this case, or cited this law review article, uh, I, I presume it's a pretty good supporting authority. And, and what, this, what this law review article says, and this is the exact quote that the Court of Appeals used, the right of petitioning is an ancient right, it is the cornerstone of the Anglo-American constitutional system. Petitioning is the likely source of all other expressive rights. And this, as we learn more about our form of government that was established in our Constitution, you'll understand what 
even better why this is the cornerstone. That it, it, is, it is literally the foundation of our Republican form of government. In this same law review article, this piece really struck me, uh, is on page one, 1155 uh, toward the bottom, common and frequent petition. Petitioning used to be common and it used to be frequent without the threat of force. We're just people coming peacefully to our government, petitioning government. It took the place of prolonged discontent and a long list of grievances presented at the point of a sword. That's what this right did, is it presented a peaceful means for citizens to interact with their government. Now, this, was, this is going back to, to medieval uh, England, con constitutional history under medieval England back to the 12th century, that common and frequent petition back then took the place of, of prolonged discontent. They did, that was in, in medieval England, uh, sovereign power was with the monarchy, with the king. That's who had sovereign power. And then later on, that power was delegated out to the legislative houses. They had legislative houses, the parliament had sovereign power in this country. And you're gonna hear it from the founders here in a minute. The sovereign power is vested in the people. Power comes from us. And so if, if power is inherent in us and our form of government is a republic and the Black's Law definition, dictionary definition of a republic is where the administration of affairs is open to all of us. And in Article 1, Section 1 of the Tennessee Constitution, power is inherent in the people. So if we have a right to instruct, power is inherent in us, and the administration of affairs is open to all citizens in a republic, how do we do that? And the answer is the right of petition in the First Amendment. And the right to instruct and do it by address or remonstrance. Literally, people, this is how we take back power. We are so sick and tired of corrupt career politicians without any term limits whatsoever. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to a point on that and talk about the sovereign power of the people. In this, in this, other, in this other law review article, they're talking about uh, the right of petition. I'm going to read this part here real quick. Uh, it's on page 155. The right of petition, so fundamental in colonial politics, was included in the Bill of Rights. Uh, the framers meant to imply a corresponding governmental duty of a fair hearing seems clear. Given the history of petitioning in the colonies and colonists' outrage at England's refusal to listen to their grievances. And although Congress in its first session approved the right of petition without comment, virtually, they just said, yeah, because this is going back to the 12th century. We've got to have the right of petition. It's in the First Amendment. That's why. So they didn't have any comment. Uh, but when, when Madison proposed his amendments in June 8, 1789, he separated the clauses from the right of, of assembly, consultation, and petition from the cause com excuse me, containing free expression, uh, free guarantees of expression of speech and of the press. And the second, the second part of this, so the first part that's important about this is they separated the right, the right of petition. It's in a separate clause. Uh, and that the people's right to instruct their, their representatives. So in the federal Congress, they were debating, are we, gonna, are we gonna put in a right to instruct along with the right to uh, petition? And they decided no. So this other one, do I have a copy of that bill of, let me grab one of these, this one here. Thank you. So this is, uh, this is a printout. There it is. This was a citation in the law review article, was this book. Uh, it was written by B. Schwartz. It's a Bill of Rights, it's documentary history in this book. This is probably the best new addition to my law library that I've had. I, I'm, I'm so excited about having this book now. They include, this, this book includes the committee hearings from 1789 when Madison and these guys were talking about this stuff. And so if we listen to the founders, listen to history, we'll have a clear understanding. So 
they're talking about, they're having the debate. This is August, uh, I think it was August 18th, 1789. And they're, and they're debating, are we gonna put in the right to instruct? Now the reason I want, I want you to understand about, about the federal discussion in the federal constitution about the right to instruct is because it lays down the foundation of our understanding of what the right to instruct means in our Tennessee Constitution because our Tennessee founders did put that we have a right to instruct. I just read it to you in the Tennessee Constitution. And in Article 11, Section 16, miscellaneous provisions, the Declaration of Rights is forever beyond the reach of government and they can't touch it. There's nothing they can do about the Bill of Rights unless they first get rid of Article 11, Section 16 and they can't ever touch it. So understanding, what is this right to instruct? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some quotes. So uh, Mr. Clymer was, was one of the members of the House back then. Actually, let me step back a little bit. Uh, when, this, when this first started, it was August 15th, the House went into a committee of the whole on pro proposed amendments to the, to the Constitution. The whole House Committee of the whole. This is one, it's, it's a committee hearing, but it's the whole house back then. And James Madison was the one that started that. He said, we've got some time here. Let's, let's the entire body of this house go into committee and let's talk about what we're gonna do in the Bill of Rights. So Mr. Clymer, he said, uh, I hope the amendment, and he's talking about the right to instruct. I hope the amendment will not be adopted but if our constituents choose to instruct us that they may be left at liberty to do so, do gentlemen foresee the extent of these words? If they have a constitutional right to instruct us, it infers that we are bound to those instructions. And so we ought not to decide constitutional questions by implication. I presume we shall be called to go further and expressly declare the members of the legislature bound by the instruction of their constituents. This is a most dangerous principle, utterly destructive of all the ideas of an independent and deliberative body, which are essential to the requisites of a legislature of three governments. So this is a, this is a member opposing, he's saying we should not put the right to instruct into the Bill of Rights, that we begin to glean, what does it mean to have a right to instruct? from their discussion. Uh, Mr. Sherman, he said, uh, Mr. Jackson was in favor of the right of the people to assemble. Mr. Jackson, he's talking about Andrew, right? Uh, Mr. Jackson was in favor of the right of the people to assemble and consult for their common good. It had been used in this country as one of the best checks of the British legislature in their unjustifiable, unjustifiable attempts to tax the colonies without their consent. And here they're referencing the right of petition was used to, to uh, go with to the British ministry and say, please don't tax us. And it was, the petitioning was used to great effect back then. But we're, we're also talking about the right to instruct here. And he said, uh, America had no representatives in the British Parliament, therefore they could instruct none. Uh, yet they exercised the power of consultation to good effect. That power of consultation is the right of petition. They exercise that to good effect. If we establish this as a right, we shall be bound by those instructions now. I am willing to leave both the people and representatives to their own discretion on the subject. Let people consult and give their opinion. Let the representative judge of it. And if it is just, let him govern himself by as a good member ought to do. But if it is otherwise, let him have it in his power to reject their desire. So he's saying, you know, yes, they can instruct us, but it's still up to the member to decide, but he has to consider. They have to think about it. They can't ignore a petition. And this, this one, this next part struck me, and I want everybody to pay, pay close attention to this one. Mr. Jerry, he said, by the checks provided in this constitution, we have good grounds to believe that the very framers of it conceived that government would be liable to maladministration. The construct of our Constitution 
it's very conceivable that government would be liable to maladministration, corruption, abuse of power. They would be liable to that. And he said, um, and I presume that the gentlemen of this house do not mean to arrogate to themselves more protection than human nature has yet to be shown capable of. He's saying to the members there, don't look at yourself and be so arrogant to say that you're not subject to the same temptation of the tyrants and the tyranny and oppression that we have suffered under the British crown. Don't be so arrogant. Don't think that you're above that. <clears throat> and, today, and today we can see why. So if they do not, if they don't admit it, uh, they, they will admit an additional check against abuses, which this, like every other, like every other government is subject to. Instruction from the people will furnish this in a considerable degree. So he's arguing to include the right of instruction as a defense against maladministration, corruption. That's why the right of petition is fundamental to our form of government. It is, it is the sword. You know, when I talk about the Constitution, it's our shield and our armor. The Declaration of Rights is our sword. It's how we defend our liberties is through the Declaration of Rights, including the right of petition, and to instruct, and to do it by address. This is fundamental to our form of government. And when we have these tyrants in the Tennessee General Assembly who ignore our petitions, this is why we declared independence from Great Britain. It's the first line in the New Hampshire Declaration of Independence for ignoring our grievances. And it's in our Declaration of Independence for altering fundamentally our form of government. The United States v. Krukashank. 1876 Supreme Court opinion, fundamental to a government Republican in character, is the right of the pe people to petition for redress of grievance. It is essential to our Republican character that this right be restored. So I, there was another piece in here. Yeah, I got I have to read this. I have to read this other piece. This part, this part blew me away. Now though, I do not believe the amendment, the right to instruct, would bind the representatives to obey the instructions. Yet I think the people have a right to both instruct and bind them. Do gentlemen conceive that on any occasion instructions would be so general as to proceed from all our constituents? If they do, if they do, it is the sovereign will for gentlemen will not contend that the sovereign will presides in the legislature. The sovereign will does not preside in the legislature. The friends and patrons of the Constitution have always declared that the sovereignty resides in the people and they do not part with it on any occasion. So to say sovereignty vests in the people and they have a right to instruct and control their representatives is absurd to the last degree. To say that we do not have a right to instruct and be heard and express the sovereign will of the people is absur absurd to the last degree. That is powerful. So you think about this. If, if, if the citizens of this republic wanted term limits, and let me tell you, 98% of us do, we're sick of career politicians like Pelosi and Schumer and all the other ones that are in there from both sides that have planted themselves in our legislative houses for far too long. If the 98% of us signed a petition and submitted it to the United States Congress under House Rule 12, Section 3, a member shall file that with the clerk of the House of Representatives in our United States Congress. And if 98% of the people want term limits, that is the sovereign will of the people. And for them to say no is to say sovereign power now rests with the legislature, which is not our form of government. 
is an unlawful alteration of our form of government, and evidence is treason to the Constitution, and evidence is that our representatives no longer represent us. They represent themselves in special interests. This is the power. I am trying so hard for so long to educate my citizens that we can literally fix everything in this country if we all stand here in Tennessee and perform our civic duty and call our representatives and call our senator and say welcome petitions again. You did so. Your predecessors did in the 1800s. They had petitions were common and frequent in the Tennessee General Assembly and they must become frequent in the Tennessee General Assembly again because we got a lot of citizens with a lot of grievances. Senator Stevens, I don't know what district he is, when I first petitioned him, he said if we accept these petitions, we'll have petitions from hundreds, if not thousands of citizens. And it breaks my heart. We have a sitting senator who is aware that we have hundreds, if not thousands, of aggrieved citizens. And since there are so many, we won't hear any of them. That is a shame. This last part on here, uh, I also left this copy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. No so this is, this is a letter that uh, I presented, or well, actually the, the second page of this is an application. I, I went to citizens across the state and I said, we have this right. This right must be restored to us. And so will you sign with me as a co-remonstrant to, co to the Tennessee General Assembly? Will you sign? And I had citizens from across the state of Tennessee said, yes, Mr. Gentry, I will sign with you. And I presented those signatures to the member of the House along with this application. And it says, uh, uh, to Representative Garrett, a large number of citizens from across the state of Tennessee assert right to apply to the powers of government for redress of grievance and proper purpose by address pursuant to Tennessee Constitution Article 1, Section 23. The right of citizens to remedy by due course of law and justice administered without delay and right to instruct their representatives and right are rights also hereby asserted requiring this application to be heard, considered, and decided according to the supreme law of the land and the conscience of the members. This application made by good citizens of the state of Tennessee seeks resolution for the members to welcome petitions and remonstrances and to hear and decide them as required by our beloved Tennessee Constitution. This application further seeks resolution to reinstate the Propositions and Grievances Committee that used to exist back in the 1800s. That's all we're asking is we want to address the body and we have a constitutional right to address them. They have a duty to listen to us address them. That whole House of Representatives, 98 members, are to be assembled and we the people are to address them and say, we want you to resolve to welcome petitions and remonstrances from the people and we want you to resolve to hear and decide them and we want you to, to, to reinstitute the propositions and grievances committee and in that address we discuss all this stuff that I just talked about how important and fundamental this right is everything that is going wrong in this country because this right is oppressed you know President Trump called on citizens to go to Washington, D.C. to protest, protest an election that he believed was fraudulent. And it didn't go well for anyone. If President Trump had instead called on his 80 million voters to co-remonstrate with him and filed a petition with the United States Congress, it would have been filed with the House clerk. And they would have assembled a committee. And they would have had to have considered that evidence and the redress that I would have suggested be sought is an audit. Let's settle the question, was or was there not fraud? Instead, the question is ignored by our highest court, 
the Supreme Court, corrupt in my opinion. I will state that frankly. I believe the Supreme Court of the United States is absolutely corrupt. Because this corruption going on in our state houses and in our state judiciaries would not be occurring if our highest court was doing their job. And they're not doing their job because they're influenced by corrupt purpose now. It is the people and only the people that have the power to preserve the American way of life. There is no knight in shining armor going to come save us. Not Trump, not me, not any one man. It's the people united in petition and remonstrance coming together that will preserve our way of life, that will restore the intended republic, and that will restore the intent of the founders and will bring back a peace and a harmony that, that has not been conceived and has not been felt in this country in a very long time. So I want you, for the people out there watching, we have to fight for this right. And, and for, the, for, for the Tennessee Firearms Association, you know, you're defending the Second Amendment, and I applaud that. But you cannot defend that right properly if you do not have the right to petition. And that right is oppressed right now. Speaker Sexton, when he announced this, and, and let, me, let me show you this real quick on here. I meant to show you these a little bit earlier. These are two, I'm gonna show you the first petition that was announced in, in uh, January of 2019, was this one. I did this as a single citizen. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 15, we have a petition so ordered. Next order, Ms. Clark. Petitions and memorials. Ms. Clark. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 15, we have a brief statement regarding a petition of remonstrance statement filed by Representative Holsey. It reads, I'm approaching the Tennessee House Chief Clerk on behalf of Mr. John Gentry with this petition and statement involves a petition of grievances. One, unconstitutional and void statutes. Two, failure to address grievances. Three, judicial reform. Four, reinstitution of constitutionally guaranteed rights. Signed, Bud Holsey, Tennessee State Representative. So that one, that was the announcement of my first remonstrance. Can you see how powerful that is? That a citizen can have the attention of the entire body. Can you see how powerful that is? This is how we fix everything. As a result of that, the entire membership of the Tennessee Board of Judicial Conduct were removed from office. All of those corrupt judges that have been protecting corrupt judges for decades were removed from office, every single one of them. And the board was reconstituted it's still wrong because I think they have six or eight judges that are holding prohibited offices. It's still an unlawful alteration, but they made an attempt. And they reinstituted that agency with six attorneys, six judges, I don't know the exact count, and six citizens on there. That's a, that's a big deal that a citizen did that by going in there and doing that. Imagine if we all came together and, and, and asserted the sovereign will of the people for whatever proper purpose we have. Imagine if we all came together and did that. Now this second one, this was just a few weeks ago. Petitions uh, and memorials. Mr. Clark. Mr. Speaker, under petitions and memorials, we have a letter dated May 3rd, 2021, addressed to the Honorable Tammy Letzler, Chief Clerk of the House of Representatives, State Capitol, second floor. Nashville, Tennessee. He's reading Tennessee, this. Three. Dear Madam Clerk, please receive the attached, quote, application by address, end quote, from John A. Gentry of Sumner County. Mr. Gentry seeks, one, restoration of the right to apply for redress of grievance or other proper purpose by address of remonstrance, and two, reinstatement of the Propositions and Grievances Committee Respectfully signed Representative Johnny Garrett. 
I don't know if you could hear it, but in the background, there was, there was some arrogant member of the house. Yeah, Johnny Garrett. These members have contempt for us. They have contempt for the people. They're mocking. That's what they're doing. He's mocking me. When he's, yeah, Johnny Garrett, he's mocking me. And, and if, you, if you listened it closely, Hicks, or, or I think Daniel Hicks is the clerk in there that was reading this, he did it on purpose, I can assure you. If you look at this letter from Garrett, it says, by address or remonstrance, which is what our Constitution says. And Hicks got up there, and you can see Speaker Sexton smirking when he does it. And he, said, he intentionally said, by address of remonstrance. Because they know that I'm fighting to get the Constitution corrected. It is wrong on the General Assembly, Secretary of State, and Tennessee Blue Book. The only place it's correct is in Tennessee Code Annotated, and no citizen goes and looks there. It is, it is, when they change the last phrase like that, it strips us of a constitutional right to address government by changing one letter of the last phrase of Article 1, Section 23. On that point alone, every one of you should be outraged and calling your members and telling them to fix the Constitution. Can we not police our own in this state? Do I have to go to a corrupt Supreme Court and beg them, please hear me? Can we not police our own in this state? Can we not take the time to call our representative, call our senator, and to instruct them Assert your right to instruct them and tell them to fix the Tennessee Constitution. And for Speaker Sexton, the next thing that's supposed to happen with that announcement is I'm supposed to get up there and explain to them everything I just explained to you about the right of petition. That's what's supposed to happen. In the House Rules of Order, I think I have a copy over there, the, the House Rules of Order for the Tennessee General Assembly and the Senate Rules of Order, House Rule 15, Senate Rule 22, petitions and memorials. After a brief statement is filed with the clerk, petitions shall be received and read at the table. It's in their own rules. They have a duty. It's a constitutional right, and they have a duty to hear, consider, and decide whether they're going to reinstate and welcome this right. And of course they have to. Or the evidence that sovereign power no longer resides with the people. Power is no longer inherent in us. And we are now ruled by an oligarchy of corrupt political elites. And I, do, for one, do not accept that. So call, take the time. I mean, every one of you should be outraged. Everybody watching online, you should be outraged that Speaker Sexton He's a traitor. He is literally, he swore an oath to uphold the Tennessee Constitution. And when you violate that oath and oppress a right, that's the definition of a traitor, betraying trust. Speaker Sexton is a traitor. He's a traitor to the trust of all of you in Tennessee. And we should call him and tell him to perform his duty, assemble the body, and hear this address presented by citizens from across the great state of Tennessee. We should all be outraged the Constitution has changed. We should all be outraged that judges are holding expressly prohibited offices of trust. And those offices of trust are used to propagate and protect corruption in the judiciary. We should all be outraged. This is the breakdown of everything that is wrong. And I'm telling you, if we stand up here in Tennessee, the volunteer state, we will lead this entire nation in restoring the republic. Let's start being the squeaky wheel. If we remain silent and apathetic, expect more of the same. But if each of you leaves here, and, and people watching online, and you talk to your friends and family and neighbors and say, listen to this guy Gentry, he makes sense. He's studied, he's learned, and he has the courage and the wisdom and the knowledge and the integrity to stand up and defend the Constitution, let's stand with him. And let's call our representatives. And let's demand that they, they fix the Constitution, that, the, that Speaker Sexton assemble the body to hear an address, 
and that these judges are removed from expressly prohibited offices. So thank you guys so much. If, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to ask. I'll, I'll run on, but if anybody has any questions. Could you uh, just re-talk about this board that was replaced in, in response to that first, uh, first video you, you yeah. played? I, I, I caught that a board was replaced, but I didn't quite get the details, the details on that. Say that, say that last. Yeah, which board was replaced and, and so what was the, the problem with that? So the question, the question was what board was replaced as, as a result of that, that remonstrance. In my remonstrance, uh, I demanded abolishment of the Tennessee Board of Judicial Conduct. I have made sworn statements in state and federal court that are uncontested. They are criminals protecting cr criminals, and they're guilty as prim principal. Since 1971, the Tennessee Board of Judicial Conduct, when it, was, when it was created statutorily, they have never once recommended removal or impeachment of a single judge. They dismiss, according to their own reports, 100% of complaints filed by non-legal professionals. In other words, the ones suffering the corruption, the litigants. They file a complaint, 100% of them are dismissed from that agency. Uh, my, a, a large part of my remonstrance is about reforming our corru the corruption in our judiciary. And one of, those, one of those reforms is to abolish that agency because judicial oversight and accountability is legislative power. That is clear in Article 5, Section 1, and in Article 6, Section 6, it is legislative power. And when the judiciary stepped into that role as judges holding expressly prohibited offices, they're violating the separation of powers doctrine, and they're holding expressly prohibited offices of trust. It's a usurpation of power. And, and when you have no check of one branch, you have tyranny. And that's why we have tyranny in our courts today. These judges are destroying lives emotionally and financially, and they do it every single day. Now you asked, so Chris Kraft was the former chair of the Tennessee Board of Judicial Conduct. He was removed from office. Timothy DeCenza was a disciplinary counsel, been there for many years. He was removed from office. The entire board was vacated and reconstituted with six new judges, four, to four or six attorneys, and six citizens. And the citizens are appointed it's still going to be, in my opinion, a do-nothing agency. How we complain about judicial corruption is we remonstrate to our district representative. He files it with the clerk. It's read on the floor. I think this judge is corrupt. I think he's violating my right of due process. That's read on the floor. And then it's sent to committee and deliberated. And they say, well, let me see the evidence. We heard the accusation. Let me see the transcripts. Let me see the orders. Show me that this judge is corrupt. Prove it. And if you can prove it, then they write up articles of impeachment and we get him out. And we stop that prolonged suffering that's occurring in our courts today, one judge at a time, by exercising the right of remonstrance. So, I mean, my, my remonstrance has not been addressed publicly, either of them. It's, I'm fighting it in the Supreme Court. I'll probably be ignored. And I don't care that I'm ignored in the Supreme Court of the United States. I don't care that Sexton and all these other corrupt politicians ignore me because I got a lot of people listening to me and power is inherent in us. And when I cause outrage in about 4% of you, I'm gonna have enough patriots standing by my side that we're going to take back Tennessee and we're going to lead this republic in restoring the intent and form of government established and created by our founders. I know this in my heart. I believe it in my soul. This is, this is no doubt, this is God's work to restore the voice and the sovereign power of the people and everything that this country stands for. I have no doubt of that. Any other questions? What was the mechanism by which these members of the board were removed? Did they, did they resign? Did they, did they Quiet. Uh, the question was, how are they removed? Uh, there were committee hearings that I was not privy to, because I can assure you, I would have been there. Uh, but there were committee, there were committee hearings. Uh, what they first tried to do, uh, actually, Representative Garrett, my district representative, uh, he presented a bill that was just going to change the name from the Tennessee Board of Judicial Conduct to the Tennessee Board of Judicial Responsibility. They were just gonna change the name and keep, doing, and keep doing the same thing. And so I got up, I just made the argument I just made to you. 
Article two, no person belonging to one branch shall exercise power uh, belonging to any of the other branches. And uh, uh, the House has the sole power of impeachment and judges can be removed by concurrent vote of both houses. It's clearly legislative power to oversee our judiciary. And the Constitution expressly prohibits judges from holding prohibited second offices of trust. Article six, section seven, no judge shall hold any other office of trust. So I made that, I made that argument in committee hearing and Representative Garrett, uh, I think being a, 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 he's an attorney, and I think recognizing that it was wrong, he took it off calendar. He said, okay, I'm, you know, no credit to me, that he's just saying, I'm gonna take it off calendar. So that was their first reaction. Then they had discussion that, well, we're gonna move this over to the Tennessee Supreme Court, that they're, they're gonna have, they're, that they're gonna put judicial oversight and accountability with our highest Tennessee court. That ain't gonna work. It is absolutely not gonna work. It's a stupid idea. Take back power where it belongs to our representatives. Our district representatives are the ones that are supposed to represent us. They're supposed to look out for our peace and safety and happiness. They're supposed to represent us. And if we got a judge that's bullying and harassing us, that belongs with the legislature. So, they had, uh, they had, I think, several hearings about this, committee hearings. I don't know if they were closed door. Uh, I, I, I've not been able to find them, but I, I've heard references. I, I know Senator Roberts, uh, when I was testifying, he, you know, he talked about we had discussions. That was his word. We had discussions about moving this to the Supreme Court. You know, I wasn't really excited about reconstituting this agency, but this is what we decided to do. And that was, at, that was at the last sunset hearing. So they were talking about it and they reconstituted it. I wrote a complaint to the Tennessee Board of Judicial Conduct just recently. Guess who I complained about? The judges in the Board of Judicial Conduct. I said, you're all holding prohibited offices of trust. You should resign immediately. You're in violation of your oath to uphold the Constitution. Judge Gay is the new chair and he wrote me back and he said, as you know, the Board of Judicial Conduct was, was the entire membership of the Board of Judicial Conduct was vacated and reconstituted to include 16 members. And here, and here they are. And that the, the Board of Judicial Conduct was created by the General Assembly and here you lay blame on me, it's them. So he, Judge Gay does not dispute that they're holding prohibited offices. He's just saying it's not my fault. General Assembly is the one that created it. Well, General Assembly with attorneys, members of the court, created it. It's the only reason they usurp legislative power and give it to the judicial branch that I can imagine. So this is a this is a big this is a big problem. But to answer your question, they were done in committee hearings. I wasn't privy to them. I can't find them. Uh, but I know they talked about it at other hearings. Well, should the General Assembly then have a committee, say a Judicial Oversight Committee? Of they have. Representatives? Do they have that? Well, what, 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 one of the things we're asking for in this last remonstrance is to is to reinstate the propositions and grievances committee. Right. They had a committee that heard grievances. Right. I've read the 1831 House Journal. Uh, there, you know. Some uh, representative so and so presented a petition on behalf of Baptist McCombs. Uh, I think one, one, uh, one was a, a tr transporting a prisoner and he wanted the state to pay him uh, for his time transporting that prisoner. And they said, resolve uh, that it's moved over to the Propositions and Grievances Committee. And then you have, and then you have other instances in the 1831 House Journal where they said, you know, Mr. McGahee, the chair, of the Propositions and Grievances Committee made report on the petitions of these people and recommended that the petitions ought not be granted. And then the whole House voted and denied them or granted them in some cases. It was clear that the, that the now with petitions, it can be sent to a special committee uh, or, you know, a, something generic like a Propositions and Grievances Committee uh, for, for judicial accountability. Maybe that goes to the Judiciary Committee of the House and the Senate, um, where they, you know, supposedly have a little bit no more knowledge about judicial process or legal process in there. But uh, somewhere, you know, 
we've got, these members have got to start listening to petitions again. And if the people are not going to stand up for this, there's nothing that's going to bring us together. You know, we're always, we're going to remain divided. But, but for this, we just want, this is just asking for our God-given right to be restored. Our right of petition. We pray to God, right? We ask God for forgiveness. We ask him for favor. These guys set themselves above God when we can't petition them. Literally. And it's an alteration of our form of government that should not be tolerated. Just like the founder said, that sovereignty will never be relinquished. He said it. I love how I love how his his language in there. The friends and patrons of this constitution have always declared that the sovereignty resides in the people, and they do not part with that on any occasion. So to say to say the sovereignty vests in the people and they have not a right to instruct and control their representatives is absurd in the last degree. Of course we have a right to instruct. Of course we have a right to petition them. Sovereign power in us. But Speaker Sexton and the corrupt political elites that are out there, they're telling you, no, we're an oligarchy. We're in charge. We don't care about power inherent, inherent in the people. We're in charge now. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. Unless I don't believe that for a minute. Unless you're a paid lobbyist, then, then that's uh, the, the one person that they'll listen to can change that. Well, you, you saw two of my remonstrances read on the floor. Announced. Not read. They were announced on the floor. That's a citizen going straight to the floor. Lobbyists, they go to subcommittee. People go straight to the floor. People go straight to the floor, and if these if these guys start doing their job, people go to the floor, they go to committee, and then they go back to the floor for final disposition. In the in the rules of order for the House and the Senate, they say anything not covered in these rules, we're going to refer to Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure. So if it's not in our rules. You know, if there's some other circumstance, we're going to go to Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure. Section 148, Mason's Manual. Petitions are presented by petitioners or by members or they're read at the table. It's in their own rule book. Section 518, any matter requiring, this one's important. Section 518, Mason's Manual Legislative Procedure. Any matter requiring the use of discretion cannot be delegated to any member committee or to another body. It's the whole house has to decide the body that it's presented to, whether it's the house or the Senate. If it's a matter requiring discretion, you can't have one representative decide it. They all have to vote. That's our form of government, people. That's the way it's supposed to work. You know, the question is, are we going to start fighting for it? Or are we going to remain silent? I'm doing everything I can, stomping my feet, advertising this out to the people. I'll take this video and I'll, I'll spend hundreds of dollars of my own money to push it out to as many people as I can get to listen to me. I do that out of my own pocket because I believe in this. Because I swore an oath to defend the Constitution. So I hope that that these will not fall on deaf ears and that citizens in this room at least will not remain silent. That we will call our senators, call our representatives and specifically call Sexton's office and tell him he's a traitor if he doesn't assemble the body to hear this address. We're just asking to welcome our petitions again from the people. What's wrong with that? <laughs>